Hello everyone, we're going to talk today about some probability rules. And you can see you rule. No, you rock. So we're going to talk about probability rules today. So our first example. Did you know I have a pizza shop? Pizzas at Mr. E's Pizza Shop come in three sizes with three types of crust, either regular pan or stuffed, and with or without cheese. So how many different types of pizza can we order? Well, the way you would set this up, you could make a list of all the different possibilities, and you can see that list being formed over there. That would take you quite some time if you wanted to make a list of all the possibilities. Or you could use something called the multiplication principle. It says that we can simply multiply the number of each choice to get the total number of choices. So since I had three different sizes and three different types of crust and two different cheeses, we can multiply them all together and we get 18 different pizzas. So it saves us having to rewrite all of that out. We don't have to write the sample space if we can do the multiplication principle. So probability number one. Probability rule number one. First, the probability, P of A, of any event satisfies zero, but is between zero and one. Right? The probability of an event that definitely can never ever happen would be zero. The probability of an event that definitely always does happen is one, and everything in between. So probability has to be between zero and one. Probability rule number two, if S is the sample space, and remember from previously that a sample space is a listing of everything that can possibly occur in this event, then if S is the sample space, then the probability of the sample space has to be one because the sample space is everything that can possibly happen. Probability rule number three, the complement. You're number one, that's a complement. The complement of any event A is the event that A does not occur and is written as A with a little c up there. The complement rule states that the probability of the complement of A is simply one minus the probability of A. This is a very handy rule. It's gonna save you lots of work in certain situations. So for example, another way to think about it, the probability that at least one outcome happens will be one minus the probability that no outcomes happen. And this is that example where this is gonna save you some time and some work in certain situations. So I'm gonna show you some examples of those in a little bit. Probability rule number four. If we have a union, probability of A, union B, if they are disjoint, remember disjoint means mutually exclusive. So if we have two disjoint events, the probability of them occurring at the same time, A, union B, would be the probability of A plus the probability of B. All right, not happening at the same time, either A or B, then that would be the probability of A plus the probability of B. If we're doing a union, so it can be in either A or B, but they are non-disjoint, so they are events that can happen at the same time, then we have to use the addition rule for non-disjoint events. And remember, all these rules, you cannot break the rules. All right, so let's do a couple of examples. A large auto center sells cars made by many different manufacturers. Three of these are Honda, Nissan, and Toyota. These are not simple events since there are many types of each brand, but suppose the probability of H is 0.25, the probability of N is 0.18, and the probability of T is 0.14. And we want to find, the pro or first of all, all the are these disjoint events? Yes, because you can't buy a car that is both a Honda, a Nissan, and a Toyota. It's either one or the other. The probability of H or N or T. Right, so that would be, basically, we would add them all up. Probability of H is 0.25, probability of N is 0.18, probability is 0.14, so all together we get probability of 0.57. By the way, that's a picture of my new car. Probability that it is not H or N or T would be 1 minus 0.57. Right, that would be the probability, which is then 0.43. If it's, if it's H or N or T, it's got to be 0.57. If it's not H or N or T, then it has to be 0.43. Okay, musical styles other than rock and pop are becoming popular. I take a survey of college students. They find the probability that they like country music is 0.40, which of course makes sense because country music is the best type of music. The probability that they like jazz is 0.30, and the probability that they like both is 0.10. What is the probability that they like country or jazz? Well, first of all, this is non-disjoint. You can have people who like both. Therefore, we use the addition rule for non-disjoint events. Probability of country plus the probability of jazz minus the probability of both. Rule number five, multiplication. 
if two events A and B are independent. All right, so remember, independent means the outcome of one is not determined by the outcome of the other. And we want to find the probability of A and B, then we simply do the probability of A times the probability of B. Now there's a general rule that goes with that. Probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B given A. That line there is a given statement, which we're going to talk a lot more about in a little bit. But uh, that is those two rules, and you have to figure out when to use which one. So let's do a couple of examples. A certain brand of light bulbs are defective 5% of the time. You randomly pick a package of two such bulbs off the shelf of a store. What's the probability that both are defective? Can we assume that they are independent? Yes. You can assume that you're randomly picking a package of two. The probability that one of the bulbs fails is not going to have any effect on the probability that the second bulb fails. So since we can assume they are independent, then we can simply use the rule of 0.05 times 0.05, and we get the probability that they both are defective is 0 0.0025. Now, probability of A is 0.45, probability of B is 0.35, and we're being told that A and B are independent. We're going to find A or B. Are A and B disjoint? Well, if A, or A and B are disjoint, are they independent? Remember that disjoint events do not happen at the same time. So if A occurs, can B occur? Well, if we know if they don't happen at the same time, that means if we know A occurs, then B can't possibly occur because we knew A occurred and they can't happen at the same time. So therefore, disjoint events are always dependent. Right? Disjoint events are dependent. So since we're being told that they are independent up in the problem, that means independent events cannot be disjoint. Disjoint events, events are dependent. Independent event, events are not disjoint. So therefore, we're going to use this rule, probability of A or B. Now, how can we find the probability of A and B? We have to know that in order to find A or B. If it's independent, we simply multiply. If it's dependent, we use the general rule. So since we are being told that they're independent, we can simply multiply A times B. And we use our rule for addition, and we get that answer. Suppose I pick two cards from a standard deck without replacement. What's the probability that I select two spades? First, are the cards independent? No, because once I pick a card out, my, the first card I pick, I can pick any of the 52 cards. But the second card I pick, I only have 51 choices left. So therefore, the outcome of the second event is dependent on the outcome of the first. So they are not independent. Therefore, since they're not independent, we have to use the general rule, which is given by that formula. We read this as the probability of B given that A occurs. So the probability of a spade and a spade. Well, the first spade would be 13 out of 52, 1 fourth, times. Now, we want the probability that we get another spade given we already drew a spade. Well, if we already drew a spade, then that means there's only 12 spades left out of 51. So that second probability is 12 out of 51. And then I multiply those together, and I get 1 17th. The probability of getting a spade, given that a spade has already been drawn. Now, a certain brand of light bulbs, we're back to this problem, are defective 5% of the time. You randomly pick a package of two. What is the probability that exactly one bulb is defective? Well, we have to think about this one a little bit. We're picking two. We want exactly one bulb to be defective. So we can either have the first bulb is defective and the second one is not, or we can have the first bulb is not defective and the second one is. So we have two probabilities we have to consider. 0 0.05, the first one's defective, times 0 0.95, the second one is good, plus 0 0.95, the first one's good, times 0 0.05, the second one's bad. Multiply all that together, add them up, and you get your probability. 
What if you randomly pick two such bulbs off the shelf? What is the probability that at least one is defective? So instead of exactly one, we want to know at least one. So it's a different problem. To do this one, we have several different possibilities. At least one. That means the first probability is the probability that the first one's defective and the second one's not. Then you have to do the first one's good and the second one's not. Then you have to do they're both defective. So we have to calculate each probability separately, multiply them out, add them all together to get our final probability. Okay, for a sales promotion, the manufacturer places winning symbols under the caps of 10% of all Dr. Pepper bottles. Dr. Pepper, by the way, is my absolute favorite soda. You buy a six-pack. What is the probability that you win something? 10% right, of the caps are going to be winners. You're buying a six-pack. We want to know what's the probability you win something. Well, the probability of winning something is that we get at least one winning symbol. Maybe we get more, maybe we get lucky, but at least one is what it takes. That would be equal to the probability that you do one minus the probability of no winning symbols. The only way I lose is if all six cans are losers. So what's the probability of that happening? Well, it would be one minus the probability. So we would do one minus. Now, if it's 10% win, that means it's 90% loss. And we, we don't want, but let's say, what's the probability that all six of them are losers? 0.9 raised to the sixth power. That's the way you calculate at least one. Told you to save you some time. That brings us then to conditional probability. Conditional probability, rule number six, says a probability that takes into account a given condition. And here's the formula. Probability of B given A equals the probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of A. You read this as the probability of and divided by the probability of the given. So in a recent study it was found that the probability that a randomly selected girl student is a girl is 0.51. The probability that this randomly selected student is a girl and she plays sports is 0.10. So if the student is fa female, what's the probability that she plays sports? For a problem like this, it's very important to identify what's A and what's B and what formula are you using to figure this out. So we are being asked to find what's the probability that she plays sports given that she's a female. That's what we're being asked to find. If the student is female, what's the probability she plays sports? So we're going to use this formula. The probability of student and play sports, or female and play sports, is 0.1. Probability of just female is 0.15. So the probability of our conditional statement is going to be those two things divided by each other. Okay, let's do another one. The probability that a randomly selected student plays sports if they are male is 0.31. So probability that a selected student plays sports if they are male is 0.31. What's the probability that the student is male and plays sports if the probability that they are male is 0.49? So again, we want to figure out what formula are we using. Probability of a student, a probability they play sports given they are male. That was the first line probability that a randomly selected student plays sports if they are male. That's the first line, 0.31. We're looking for the probability that they are a male and play sports. That's what we don't know, so that's x. And then the probability they're male is 0.49. Set up your equation, put in the numbers, solve it, and you're done. You can also find probabilities from two-way tables. So here's a table of different uh, staff and ethnicities. So what's the probability? that the driver, this is a list of drivers, is a student. Well, we would just go down and we'd figure out all the students. There's 195 out of the total, 359. So probability of a student, 195 out of 359. Pretty easy. What's the probability the driver drives an American or an Asian car? Well, probability if they drive an American or an Asian car. Is that disjoint? Yes, it is disjoint because they can't happen at the same time. So we take all the American and Asian cars, 212 plus 102, and then we divide by 359 for the total. What's the probability that the driver is staff and, keyword, drives an Asian car? There are 47 people who, drive a who are staff and drive an Asian car, so therefore we have that probability. 
if the driver is a student, what's the probability they drive an American car? So this is a conditional. If the driver is a student, we know they're students, what's the probability they drive an American car? Well, if they're a student, we're only interested in 195 out of our table, not the whole 359, just 195. So 107 of those students drive American cars, so 107 out of 195 is our answer. What's the probability the driver is a student if the driver drives in a European car? So once again, if we know they drive a European car, there's only 45 of those people. What's the probability that one of those people is a student? Well, we would set that up and say 33 out of 45. That's all I have for you, so I'll see you in class tomorrow.